Hey everyone, and thanks for jumping back into the Cryptoverse. Today, we're gonna to talk about Bitcoin, and we're gonna be providing an update to the bull market support band. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, and also check out the sale on Into the Cryptoverse Premium at intothecryptoverse.com. Let's go ahead and jump in. So I do like to provide relatively frequent updates on where we are with the 20 week estimate and the 21 week EMA. If you are unfamiliar with them, they essentially help us define various parts of the market cycle. Of course, when we're above it, we refer to it as the bull market support band. When we're below it, it's more so considered to be the bear market resistance band because when you're below it, you'll often find many times where you just struggle to get back above it. Um, and if you do, right, it's a very short, shortly lived. And then when you get above it, that's ultimately where you expect to hold support if it's going to remain intact, right? If the uptrend is going to remain intact, you would expect it to hold support at the bull market support BAM. Now, one of the things that we mentioned a few weeks ago was that Bitcoin could easily bounce off of the bull market support BAM, right? It give us another bounce, but that it could ultimately fade going into the August and September timeframe. Now, if you look previously, on sort of the time between prior tests of it, or at least most recently, you can see that this one was about three months, right? It was from March until June. I know we, we got back above this back in, in January, but really the, the move started, you know, somewhere over here back near the end of the year. So about three to four months or so um, is, is what you're looking at here between about three months between this one and the one that came in, in about mid-June. And so the speculation of potentially retesting it as we got out into August or September does seem like it could actually manifest, right? I mean, you know, back over here, it wasn't really clear if Bitcoin was just going to continue to break out or if it would just consolidate and, and fade back into the 20 week SMA. The latter more so seems to be what's happening, right? I mean, we haven't seen any continuation of this, of this move higher. We did put in a slightly higher high, but ever since then, the price of Bitcoin has slowly faded back down. Now, the reason that I think it's at least relevant to talk about it now is because one of the things that we've said previously is that in the pre-having year, the expectation is that you go about, you, you spend half the year going up and half the year going down. Now, I know this is not ultimately what a lot of people view as the most likely scenario this year. Okay, I mean, there's no shortage of people who are bullish on Twitter. And I will say, I mean, you know, all scenarios should be considered. Um, I, I don't really consider the the new highs this year narrative as the most likely outcome. I, I, I've, I've fallen into that trap before thinking that in prior cycles and it never actually happened. Could this time be different? Maybe, but I, I still do not think it will be any different. It kind of reminds me of, you know, back in the summer of 22, right? Think back to like that that um, that June, July, and August timeframe where people were saying that, that this time is different, right? And what was interesting back then is that there were so many people bullish on, on altcoins and on Bitcoin and saying that this time is different. And the reason was because they were looking at this peak as opposed to this one and saying, well, technically a year has passed and therefore the low should be in, okay? Now, what I said was that, yeah, well, while there's a lot of indicators that would say that this was the top, at the end of the day, price action is king, not the indicators that attempt to describe price action. And so what you go by is the actual peak, not the, the indicator peak. And it was because of that that we said that June was not the bottom, right? And that we would likely get a lower low in Q4. We've also said that in the pre-having year, we expect to go about half up and half down. And of course, there's a lot of people that are looking at this and hoping that it breaks out to the upside. And hey, maybe it will, right? I mean, look, I, I have Bitcoin. That's the only really crypto, that's the only cryptocurrency I've even bought in the last 18 months. Uh, I've, I've steered clear to the altcoin market because I do expect the dominance to go higher. But I will say that there's this, I don't know if you want to call it like a curse that hits Bitcoin in Q3 of the pre-having year. And I want to talk about that uh, just a little bit. Okay. So in my experience, all I can go is based on my experience. Remember, it was my experience of, of getting wrecked here in Q4 of 2018 
that made me very skeptical that these were the lows, especially in the altcoin market, right? And we know Bitcoin went lower. We said that in the pre-halving year, alts can put in new lows, even if Bitcoin doesn't. And we've actually seen a lot of altcoins put in new lows, even though Bitcoin hasn't, right? So a lot of these things that we talked about, they have in fact come true, even though it doesn't always feel like it, right? One of the reasons I think it doesn't always feel like it is because oftentimes markets will go up more frequently than they'll go down. It's just that we go when they, they, they take the stairs up and the elevator down. So when they move down, they move down quite quickly, but then they'll just slowly grind higher until there's something else, you know, something else to worry about in the altcoin market. But if you look back when we talk about this curse that occurs in about Q3 of the pre-having year, is there any guarantee that it's going to happen again? No. You know, if you're here to find out what's guaranteed to happen, uh, then you should go somewhere else. Because I, I honestly, I, I can't tell you that. What I do know is that in every Q3 of every prior pre-having year, Bitcoin at going into it was above the bull market support band, at least going into the to the August time frame. And then come late August or September, it fell below. Okay? Now, don't take my word for it. We're going to go through it systematically so we can... We can verify this, right? Don't trust, verify. In 2019, Bitcoin rallied for half the year, faded for the second half, right? And guess where it fell below the 20-week moving average, right? It occurred in September of 2019. And if you go back to 2015, you'll find again that we were above the 20-week SMA in July, but then we fell below it in August. So you have two examples now where in both prior pre-having years, we were above the 20-week SMA in July, and then we fell below it either in August or September. These are mostly the two cycles that people look at. But fortunately for us, we have another data point that we can look at, and that's going back all the way to 2011. Now, in this case, we have another example where we were above the 20-week SMA in June and July, but come August, we got a weekly close below. We bounced back up briefly and then get another, got another weekly close in August and then continue to fade. So what my own experience has taught me is that the most likely outcome at some point in the next two months would be for Bitcoin to fall below the 20-week SMA. Now, is it a guarantee? Absolutely not, right? Absolutely not. I don't want you to think that there is, there are any guarantees in this market. History shows that there are no guarantees in this market. But one reminder, okay? One reminder. And I, I've fallen into these traps myself, right? I mean, I'm not, I'm certainly not perfect. Um, but if you think about it like this, history has repeated pretty well so far. Okay, we had a peak here, the end of 2013. We had a peak here, the end of 2017. We had a peak here, the end of 2021. We had sort of a low that came in Q3 of the bear market year that oftentimes people think is the low and it doesn't end up being the low. And then in Q4 or Q1, of the bear market year slash pre-having year, you get a new low. It happened in 2014, 2015. It happened in 2018, 2019. And of course, as you know, in recent memory, it happened in 2022, 2023, right? Every single time. So, so far we have a peak, a low in, you know, the second or, or like the, around the third quarter of the bear market year where people think it's the bottom, and then we go lower in Q4. And then we spend about half the year going up and half the year going down, historically, right? So yes, I get the arguments to say that this time is different, but so far those arguments have not held any water, right? In fact, if you had gone with the this time is different view a year ago, especially in altcoins, I mean, you would have gotten wrecked as we got into the end of the year. And many of those altcoins put in new lows just a couple months ago. So it's hard for me to look at this and say that this time is different, right? It's hard for me to say that 
because I don't think it is. I think the most likely outcome is for Bitcoin to fall below the bull market support band in August or September. Now, if it doesn't happen and Bitcoin holds the line and rallies on up, then you could argue that this time is different. But nothing yet about this cycle says that. Okay, again, you can look at various indicators that say that like that this was the peak or that this was the bottom because this was like a higher low on some indicator. But if you only care about price action and, and you know, the thing that we look back on in, in 10 years when we look at this market cycle stuff, we see a peak, we see a bottom that everyone thinks is the bottom, and then we get the, the low in the bear market, a peak, the bottom that everything, everyone thinks is the bottom, and then a low in the bear market, a peak, a bottom that everyone thinks is the bottom, and then a low in the bear market. And every single time in Q3 of the pre-halving year, Bitcoin fell below the 20-week SMA. It happened here, it happened here, and it happened here. Now, why did Bitcoin fall below it? You know, was there anything specific that caused Bitcoin to fall below? Well, I'm glad you asked, right? It was not really crypto related. In all cases, it was never, at least as far as I remember, it was never crypto related. It was more so a risk off type move across the broader markets. That's what it was. It had nothing to do with crypto at all. I've even said, I mean, you know, I've been very, very cautious on the altcoin market because of the regulatory risk and the, the liquidity risk. I think the regulatory risk on the altcoin market isn't as big of a deal now as it was maybe a year ago. But I still view liquidity as, <clears throat> as a potential risk here. When you think about what has caused Bitcoin to go below the 20-week SMA in Q3 of the pre-having year, what do you think it was? Again, it was the stock market that dropped. It wasn't Bitcoin dropping by itself in a vacuum. It was the stock market that dropped. And it was the stock market that ultimately sent crypto into a downtrend for the second half of the year. Okay. So we know that that has happened several times, okay? And I, you know, again, let's not take my word for it. Let's just go take a look, okay? So year-to-date ROI, and we're going to take a look at the S&P 500, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to go through systematically the pre-election years, Right? For Bitcoin, we think about it pre-having. For the S&P 500, what's more important is the fact that it's a pre-election year. So we have 2023, climbing the wall of worry, right? The S&P loves to climb the wall of worry in the pre-election year. We know that. And we've said that until you either get the reacceleration of inflation or a softening in the labor market, then climbing the wall of worry is exactly what the S&P is going to do. Now, we had a correction over here in the S&P 500 earlier this year, even though, you know, the, the, the labor market didn't soften up and even though we didn't really see inflation reaccelerate. But again, the market doesn't have to go monotonically up for it to be an uptrend, right? There's sometimes there's seasonality associated with pre-election years. Take a look at 2019. What happened with the S&P 500 year-to-date ROI? Is this time really any different? In terms of where we are today and where we are where we were back in 2019, the year-to-date ROI is more or less the same. It's not really that different. It's the same. And you can see that it was around this time that the S&P 500 started to get a small correction. Now, it still ended the year higher than where it is today or where it was back then on this date. But it didn't stop the S&P from at least getting a temporary correction in August and September. And it was that weakness by the S&P that brought Bitcoin below 
its bull market support band over here in 2019. What happened in 2015? Why did it fall below it over here? Well, let's pull up 2015. We can keep 2019 up there if you just want to just want to see it. This comparison, look at 2015. What happened? The S&P, we had a recession scare, right? We didn't actually get a recession, but a lot of people were worried about one, and we avoided it narrowly. It was in like that September time frame, August, September time frame. The S&P saw a sizable correction. Now, it still recovered in Q4, just like it did in 2019, but it knocked Bitcoin down to a double bottom. What happened in 2011? You can see that Bitcoin fell below the bull market support band. What was the S&P doing in 2011? That's 2011 compared to 2023. Again, you have a correction in the S&P 500 in the August, September timeframe of the pre-election year. So you take 2011, 2015, and 2019, and in all cases, there was a correction in the pre-election year, in the pre-election year, before, right before, and, and it occurred that was that correction that ultimately led to Bitcoin closing below the 20-week SMA. And in two of the cases, Bitcoin spent the rest of the year below the 20-week SMA at 2011. Right? I mean, it got above it right like right at the end of December 2011. Spent the rest of the year mostly below the 20-week SMA. 2019, it spent basically the rest of the year below the 20-week SMA. Right? 2015, it stayed below the 20-week until October. Now, remember, 2015 was a little different than 2011, 2019, in the fact that the first half of the year was mostly green as opposed to red. Whereas in 2011 and 2019, most of the first part of the year was green. Uh, or sorry, it was, sorry, in 2015, it was mostly red the first half of the year. In 2011 and 2019, it was mostly green the first, first half of the year. So we have this situation where, again, one of the things that's interesting to do is maybe take an average, right? Average out the last three pre-election years. So 2019, 2015, and 2011, and look to see what it does. So it's around this time where we've seen a correction by the S&P 500 in the pre-election year. So if Bitcoin is going to do something different this time, and if it's not going to go below the 20-week SMA, then I would have to imagine it would also correspond to the S&P not getting this seasonal correction. Now, what's more interesting is that this is not limited to recent history, right? We can look at 2019. We can look at 2015. We can look at 2011. There's a some seasonality around August and September. But you can go back to 2007 and see another correction around that time frame. You can go look at 2003 and see a very, very slight correction, right? Not much, but it's still there, or it's still there. It's not like it was just in a, in a straight uptrend. I mean, it mostly had leveled out, got a brief correction in that August, September time frame, and then continued up into Q4. You can look at 2000, or sorry, you can look at 1999, and why don't I just take some of these off so we can actually keep comparing? I mean, it's, it's kind of hard when you when you have a lot on there. 2023 to 20, uh, this is 1999. 1995. This one I was looking at earlier. This one was an interesting year because it didn't get the correction, right? It actually didn't get the correction. It just continued to climb the wall of worry um, basically for the rest of the year. 1991. A little bit of a correction right here. The thing that's interesting about a lot of this is that when you when you look closely at some of these years, right? Like here's here's 1991. You see a, a strong move in the first part of it, and then it basically just went sideways for a long time. So the years that it the year some of the years that you don't see that seasonal correction also tend to correspond to like 1991, um, just a relatively weak year overall. I mean, it was basically just going sideways. Perhaps if it had climbed the wall of worry earlier in the year, we would have gotten a correction, but in fact, we didn't. And you can look at 1987. This one actually came a bit later. So 1987 is an example where we climbed the wall of worry, 
but the you know we, we did get a correction in that August September time frame, but then the big drop came actually in October. This was also a, this was a pre-election year. Um, I believe the Fed pivoted in 1987 as well, and and this was this was like a 20% drop, um, just essentially overnight uh, for the stock market. And again, we can go back further if you want. And you're not going to see that seasonal correction by the S&P 500 every pre-election year in August or September, but it does in fact occur in most, as you can see here in 1983, and, and we can go take a look at 1979. Um, this is one that you can see that it, it got that correction right out at around day 246, a pretty big drop right here. We're currently on day two, 210. So that one more so corresponds to September, and then another bigger one comes say like October uh, than it did August. But what's interesting is in most pre-election years, we see a seasonal correction in the stock market. So if Bitcoin is to hold the line, then I, would, I must assume that the stock market does not get that seasonal correction. But because this is what typically we see, I tend to err on the more cautious side and just say, well, this is what normally happens in pre-election years. We have climbed the wall of worry a lot this year, and it wouldn't, it should not be surprising if we get some form of correction in August or September. And I'm not even saying it needs to be, you know, quote unquote, the big one to, to take us back down. But even if it's just a, a small correction into a higher low, um, we could, you know, that could still drop Bitcoin off this 20 week SMA. One interesting thing that a lot of people have said is is wondering and again i used to wonder this too and, and this time I, I don't really wonder it nearly as much because I've, I've seen it happen many times before but there's this idea of you know why is the s p going higher and getting close to new highs while bitcoin is just kind of sitting flat this is no different than 2019. in fact in 2019 we were already putting in new highs before this and bitcoin still look at this i mean just look at this move Bitcoin was going down, the S&P was going up. Look at 2015, right? Look right here. The S&P here was going up, putting in new highs, Bitcoin was going down. Here, 2018, stock market was going up, putting in new highs, Bitcoin wasn't going anywhere. There's plenty of examples in history where the S&P goes up and, and Bitcoin doesn't go anywhere. Plenty of examples. Okay, so it shouldn't really be that surprising that the S&P is going up, but Bitcoin is, is again stuck in traffic on Struggle Street. We've seen this many times before. Cryptocurrency is, is, at least in my opinion, is more so a function of excess liquidity, especially the altcoin market. And so, and I mean, it affects Bitcoin because a lot of that liquidity from the altcoin market can make its way over to Bitcoin during Bitcoin rallies, but when excess liquidity is low, there's not nearly as much money in the altcoin market, therefore there's less fuel for Bitcoin to sort of draw from, just because there's not nearly as much interest in altcoins, therefore there's not as much liquidity in the entire asset class. So that's that should be nothing new. So I, I look at the bull market support band and you know I, I, I see where it currently is, right? It's you know it's right around this um 27.8 to 28.6 level, right? So more or less around 28 to 29 thousand dollars. And I look at it and I say, well, is it going to hold us support again? You can see we are fading into it, into that August, September time frame, like we talked about, was a likely scenario. Is it going to hold? History would show, I mean, history would, would, would show that it won't. Because in the prior three, the prior three pre-having years, it hasn't. Okay. Um, history also shows there's occasionally a pre-election year where the stock market doesn't get that August and September seasonal correction. But most of the time, it does. So I tend to err on the side of what tends to happen more frequently. Now, occasionally, if you go with that way, you're going to be wrong about things. I mean, that's okay. I mean, I, you know, I'm going to get things wrong all the time. But I, I, I just go back and say it's a fact that a lot of the people that thought this was the bottom ended up sort of eating those words when we dropped to a new low in Q4, just like we always do, right? Just like we always do. 
And every every single time, people say this time is different. Every single time, even in again, even in Q3 2022. I mean, you know, the altcoin market was screaming higher over here in Q3 of 2022. It still dropped new lows in Q4. One of the fundamental reasons I think oftentimes Bitcoin goes below the 20 week SMA, if you want to go beyond the stock market and say it's not stock market related, is because oftentimes in the pre-having year, the first half of the pre-having year, a lot of meme coins and scams come to fruition, right? Like, yes, we always have that stuff, but after a long bear market, I think a lot of people are desperate for gains. And so then there's some people that see that desperation and they launch a lot of scams and, and they try to draw people in. And it does draw people in, to my dismay. Like I, I wish people wouldn't wouldn't get into that stuff because a lot of people just keep getting rugged over and over and over again. But there's this idea that the reason Bitcoin tends to drop in the second half, you know, into in Q3 of the pre-having year, is because it has to crush all the garbage that has come out in the first half of the pre-having year that's completely useless. Now, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. We've seen that happen many times where, you know, where Bitcoin, you know, it rallies in the first half of the pre-having year. A lot of, a lot of um, scams are created. A lot of people YOLO in and on the promises of, of crazy returns only for Bitcoin to roll over halfway through and to crush the meme coins, right? Saw it happen last cycle. Um, especially last cycle. Last cycle was was quite rampant with meme coins in 2019. This time is not different, right? I mean, we, we had meme coins back in 2019. Most of them went to zero, right? Just check a chart for the, the, you probably don't even know what those meme coins are. Why don't you know what they are? Because they're relics of a prior cycle and no one cares about them anymore. But believe me, there were a lot of them. There were a lot of them. A close below the 20 week SMA would be relatively detrimental for the altcoin market, right? I mean, it would. And not not to say that every altcoin has to go put in a new low, but again, I've, I've maintained that, you know, there will be some altcoins that outperform. Some of the altcoins will bottom at various times. I mean, we saw many altcoins put in new lows a few weeks ago. Um, some have, have even put in new lows recently, depending on, on how far down, you know, the, the list you go. Um, but that's something we've also seen. So, I am going to stick with what my own experience says is the most likely outcome, okay? I'm not going to change my tune just because crypto Twitter is bullish, okay? I'm going to stick with what I've seen, and that is in the second half, in, 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 in Q3 of the pre-halving year, we tend to see Bitcoin fall below the 20-week SMA in, in, in August or September, every single pre-having year. You know, after I made a video uh, back over here in, in Q3 over here saying that I thought a lower low was coming and then when we got a lower low, I made a video saying the lower low. But after I made videos, there are all sorts of people saying, no, this is wrong. It's not gonna go lower. This time is different. You know, people, you know, Ben should be looking at this high rather than this one. I mean, I have all the same indicators that say that this was the high as well, but, and then we go lower. So it's hard for me to go into this thinking this time is any different. I feel like people are falling for the same thing that the people last cycle fell for, only for Bitcoin to fade for the second half of the year. So we'll see. Um, we'll see what happens. To keep myself honest, you know, you should know what is, you know, what, what is the more bullish view and like, why would we not fall below it? I suppose that, and again, if you just look at some of the price action, you could argue, right? You could make the argument that this looks similar to this, right? Where you kind of get a move higher, it then bounces off the 20 week, and then you go back up a little bit more, and then you go sideways into the bull mark sport band, um, and then you finally pop up to a new high, right? You could argue that, right? I'm not saying you can't. I mean, you certainly could argue that. And I have to imagine that that is where some of that sentiment, the bullish sentiment is coming from to say, well, what if we're here, you know? There's a chance, right? Anything's possible. There's also some differences, right? I mean, like if you were to go look at, at say, you know, interest rates 
and look to see where interest rates were over here, I mean, they were basically at, at zero. The, the, we were only at the very beginning of a rate, a rate hiking cycle. And that rate hiking cycle was very slow compared to the one we just experienced, right? I mean, it only got us to 2.5% before the Fed started to ha before the Fed had to cut. Now interest rates are all the way up here at five and a half percent. So it's not the exact same thing. I would still say that in the pre-having year, we tend to get half up, half down. And the reason for that is to get both bulls and bears sufficiently wrecked, right? You go up long enough to give the bulls a false sense of security to make them think that this time is different, just like to just like the market made them think that this time is different in Q3. You go up long enough to make them think that this time is different only for the bottom to fall out and for us to enter into a downtrend going into the second half of the year, right? Or at least, you know, the, the latter part of the year. I mean, you could already argue the downtrend has commenced if, if, um, if we don't go put in new highs. So... That's my view. So I think, I mean, just to take a stand, because I mean, I feel like I have to do that, right? My most likely outcome, the most likely outcome to me is that Bitcoin falls below because that's what it's always done. Now, there are some people I've seen, they say, well, we have an inverted yield curve. It's going to be different this time because of the inverted yield curve. What if it's not? I mean, like, what if, you know, we had an inverted yield curve in 2019. You know, I mean, I, I don't even understand how we can use that argument as the reason that this time is different. We had an inverted yield curve over here too, right? If you don't believe me, which you shouldn't, you should always, um, remember, you should always, um, you know, look to see what's actually, you know, l look to see what actually happened. Don't just take my word for it. Um, but if you were to take a look here, and I need to switch this to a new scale. Let me switch, um, switch this to log. So here, sorry, this is the wrong one. Look, I want this one on a regular scale. Okay. So here I'm looking at the, um, the spread on the three month and the 10 year. So I'm just taking the 10 year minus the three month. Sorry, the 10 year minus the three month. So anything below zero so anything below the zero line, which is more or less right here, that's an inverted. You have an inversion of the three month of the 10-year yield. So you can't even say that this time is different because we have an inverted yield curve because we had an inverted yield curve here too. And in fact, once this was the most inverted, the top was already in, right? Now in this case, you can see that it became the most inverted around the May timeframe. And that would say that April was a pretty significant top. We know we wicked higher than that, right? So it could mean that this could go lower. Could mean that the wick is, is, not, is nothing more than a wick and the, the uptrend is, is over. Um, I don't know. But if you're going to say that this time is different because we have an inverted yield curve, then I would just say, well, we have an inverted yield curve in 2019 too. And we still, you know, we, we still faded in the second half of the year. So I can't even, I mean, I can't really accept that argument either because that's, what we, I mean, I remember in 2019, I, I distinctly remember the, the, the yield curve being inverted. People screaming a recession was around the corner um, and me not really believing it. And, and what's interesting is, is while Bitcoin faded, even after un the uninversion of the yield curve, the S&P just kept climbing because that's what it does, right? It climbs the wall of worry until it has a sufficient reason not to do so. Not just because the yield curve says a recession is coming, but it needs to actually have that catalyst to send the unemployment rate higher. And we don't have that yet, right? We just simply don't have it. So I, you know, I have to look at that. It is interesting that the last cycle, right? We had an inverted yield curve. And then we got a recession and then Bitcoin exploded. This time we have an inverted yield curve. Perhaps we get a recession in early 2024, four years potentially after what we had in 2020. And, and then Bitcoin makes that move to new highs after that. So my ultimate view is that Bitcoin will eventually see new highs. You know, I'm not, I'm not macro bearish. I just think that normally 
there's a secondary scare that comes for Bitcoin before the halving. So what happens is people talk about the halving and people get hyped up around the halving. And then what normally happens is that the price of Bitcoin, you know, halves before the halving. And then people start to sort of mock the idea. People say, oh, well, the halving just meant the price of Bitcoin was halving. And then, and then we actually get the halving and then the price goes up. You can see that happened over here, right? And in fact, I mean, in 2015, it was actually quite brutal. It was a lot, it was a lot quicker than, than 2019. Um, in here in 2015, you can see that Bitcoin basically got a 50% correction, like within just a few weeks. It was, it was actually really rapid and it started essentially, you know, like the end of July and, and by August, you know, Bitcoin had dropped 48%, 49% to put in a double bottom. So you had a 50% drop before the halving, right? And in 2019, you had this high here, and then ultimately Bitcoin dropped 72% before the halving. Now, we did have a recession. We also had an inverted yield curve the year before. Sound familiar? Um, but even if you don't take that, right, even if you ignore the recession, Bitcoin still had a 50% correction. So if you were to tell me, Ben, like, you know, throw the pandemic out the window, like, don't bring the black swan crap in here, we still had a 50% drop in Bitcoin before the halving, after the after the, the halving year rally, just like we had over here. Which is something to think about, right? It's something to think about. Again, the bullish narrative is all over Twitter. You there's plenty of people that'll tell you what the bullish narrative is. And I would buy I would love to just put on the rally cap. I just know from my own experience that the same narratives popped up last cycle and the cycle before. And both times Bitcoin fell below the 20-week SMA in August or September of the pre-halving year. The altcoin market got crushed, and it was around that time that altcoins finally bottomed out against Bitcoin. Now, in 2019, many altcoins kept putting in new lows. And over here, it wasn't, it wasn't as bad because Bitcoin just sort of, it got a, it got a very quick correction to the downside and then just exploded um, out, into, out into the halving year, right? But even this move here didn't really come until, you know, the end, like basically the early part of November, late October. So it's still, you know, still a few months out. So that's where we are, guys. I mean, you know, I, I, I still think that there's a lot of, um, there's, there are a lot of, you know, crap. There's a lot of crap out there. A lot of meme coins that need to get flushed out still. Bitcoin normally is able to accomplish that by getting a weekly close below the 20 week SMA and the 21 week EMA in Q3 of the pre having year. If you think this time is different, um, which look, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that it can't be, but I'm saying if you think this time is different, then I would watch the stock market because if the stock market shows any signs of a correction, then normally that's what sends Bitcoin below the 20-week. So if the S&P does not get a correction, then perhaps we hold the line. But if it does get that seasonal correction that we tend to get most of the time during the pre-election year in the August-September timeframe, then the expectation would be that Bitcoin closes below the 20-week SMA, the altcoin market gets crushed once again on their Bitcoin pairs, and maybe it's around that time that they finally bottom out against Bitcoin, which should ultimately send the Bitcoin dominance higher. Remember, the Bitcoin dominance theory states two things. It's that, well, I mean, one thing mainly, it's just the Bitcoin dominance goes up no matter the direction of Bitcoin USD. We know that if Bitcoin dominance goes up when Bitcoin rallies, we've seen that all year. We still need to see Bitcoin dominance go up when Bitcoin USD goes down. That hasn't happened yet. And history shows that's a necessary component. We'll see if it happens. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Give the video a thumbs up. And again, check out the sale on Into the Cryptoverse Premium at IntoTheCryptoverse.com. See you next time. Bye.